Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 196 for Wednesday, January 16th, 2019. folks and welcome to gig gab the podcast by for and about working musicians here back in durham new hampshire happy new year everyone i'm dave hamilton and back here in los gatos california it's paul kent we are back we are back that's right we haven't done this since new year's eve so uh craziness crazy crazy you went to Vegas, right? Uh, I was in Vegas last week for CES. Um, New Year's Eve, I uh, played my two shows, right? I think we did. Yeah, that was actually kind of crazy. I, had, I hadn't thought about this in a couple of weeks. We um, So we had a, 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 the final performance of that run of Hedwig, which has now been reprised uh, for next weekend or something like that, which I think was cool. Uh, and then as soon as that ended, we emptied the theater, refilled the theater, and... Uh, did a New Year's Eve Rocky Horror performance at midnight. And I couldn't have been happier that it was New Year's Eve because Hedwig started at nine. By the time we finished, it was like 1105. And there was no room to delay the start of Rocky Horror because we were starting it as the ball dropped. Right. Mm -hmm. So it otherwise, I guarantee you, we would have been on a 30 minute delay just because there was way too much to like empty the house, refill the house. It, we had different musicians coming in. Our keyboard player, um, his car ran off the road. It was snowing like crazy that night. His car ran off the road on the way to the theater. He was fine. His car actually turned out to have been fine, but uh, obviously that delayed him uh, substantially. Our bass player didn't get there until maybe 15 minutes before midnight. So Sounds stressful. It was, it was nuts. Yeah. Even though I had like almost an hour between, you know, getting off stage and getting back on stage, it felt a lot shorter than like a normal 15 minute break, uh, for any, you know, like club gig or anything, but it all worked out. And it, as the ball dropped, we played all Lang Syne and you know, it was, uh, it was good. That's cool. Yeah. It just we, kind of reminds me of like the, the switch over in festival gigs. Like the time is the time, right? Yes. If you miss your time, you're really just eating into your time and, and you're you're living with those trade offs of like, all right, this isn't a perfect sound check. It's not quite right, but we got to go. We got to go. Got to go. You know, you're, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's really stressful. I mean, I think I share our band because we have so many people that we need to mic and, you know, get happy with a monitor. Yeah. Um, you know, a half hour just never will do it. And and I we only have one. I've been cutting down every year. And taking less of those. And the one that we're going to take this year, I'm actually going to ask if they can do, instead of a half hour turn, I'm going to try and be bold. And I think I have enough leverage in this conversation to say, hey, can you put an acoustic act on in front of the stage, right? While yeah, we're smart. Getting, getting set up, right? Yep. And so the music can keep going, you know, but let us, let us get it right because it's just a better show if you can let us get it right. Yeah, totally. Yeah, we had... I'm trying to think of how many microphones there were, but uh, you know, I mean, for Rocky Horror, I think it's uh, 15 vocalists, right? Mm -hmm. So we had to sound check all of those mics. Yeah, holy cow! Crazy. I know. It's the worst part about that is our onstage in ear mix because it, you know I have, in addition to you know kick snare overhead maybe uh, of my stuff, and then generally the band stuff, keyboard, you know, guitar and bass. Uh, and, and mixing those channels on the fly for to, so that I can hear having 15 different vocalists and trying to play and mm. adjust those levels. No, uh, mm. it's really difficult. So I just started. What I want to do is submix the vocalists into one mix and compress the crap out of it. So because the problem is they're speaking and then singing. And so, you know, and sometimes somebody will shriek or something and I don't want that loud. You know, I, I want everything the same volume. It's really hard to do. But if I if we could run them into a submix and just compress that, that would be great. Uh, what I did that night and what I've done recently is I just compress my entire monitor mix. So it doesn't sound all that good, but the levels are where I need them to be. 
And I mean, when I say I compress it, I basically put a limiter on it, which is to say that when the sound level gets above a certain uh, a certain point, it just does not allow that anymore. It, it, it mm. just, you know, it just reduces it down, but it keeps me from it from being overloaded in my ears, but also able to hear. But yeah, it's 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 a crazy thing. So, yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I have an, I have an interesting topic to raise for one of our first, uh, you know, problems to solve of sure. the year. Are you ready? Yeah. I am aware that I've lost a couple fans in recent time, and I think I'm keenly aware of why. And my initial reaction to losing them has been like, well, that's that's part of the deal. They come, they go. Yep. But then I'm also reminded that we're kind of in the business of trying to keep as many as we can. Right. That's true. We are right. That's I mean, and, and, and that's true of our uh, that's true of most businesses, to be fair. Keep, right? keep your customers. Keep your yeah. customers. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So the the problem is, and and you know, I own the problem because my particular makeup, like I said, my initial response to this is say, hey, the deal is this. I play music. If you like it, you come. If you don't like it, you don't come. That's the essence of our relationship here. But that is a little bit of a of a hardball approach to it. So I believe I've lost both of these fans. One of them was someone who would you know usually bring six, eight people to my acoustic gigs, occasionally to the electric gigs as well. And one of them was um, a single, you know, one person who would come. I think both of them wanted um, more of a, of a friendship mm. than I was, you know, physically able to give. I like them both, you know, they're nice people. Um, but I, you know, uh, invitations to go to dinner or come to their house for parties or, you know, these types of things when I couldn't do it, I think created hard feelings. Um, and also when those requests are made, I actually can, I'm very keenly aware, like, okay, this is, this is an interesting situation that we're in here because right. I do like the person. I, um, I'm pretty protective of my time when I'm not playing, you know, I, I mean, truth be known, Terry and I aren't terribly social to begin with that we're going out on nights that I'm not playing anyway. Right. But um, my ability to communicate or draw a barrier that still works for them and still gets them to, you know, want to attend my music. Now, again, here's the other thing. It also dawns on me that my premise that the, the essence is if you like the music, you'll come. That might not have been the initial, initial premise. There might've been something else for them. Might've been the social scene around coming to see me, but you know, there's, there's other things that could have been at play. But I would just wanted to get your um, kind of feedback. Uh, and have you ever been in a situation like this? Have you ever like, you know, you, you like the person, you say hi, you, you, you get on a name basis, you know, maybe even, you know, if a group is hanging out of, of music people in your community, you, you, you might send them a note, include them. But have you ever actually lost a fan? Because clearly what both sides wanted out of the relationship weren't going to be the same thing. All the time. I, I'm, oh. <laughs> I'm terrible at this. Well, it, the problem is that you hear me on the show, right? I I'm outgoing. I'm friendly on stage. I'm a performer and in a club in the moment, it's like, yeah, I'm very happy to speak with you here. Like that, that part's all actually very genuine. What you don't see there that is also genuine is that I'm generally kind of a shy person. I don't necessarily like to like I'm uncomfortable in a bar if I'm not playing to be perfectly honest sure. uh, you know sure. um and and I think that's probably true of a lot of musicians but I, I don't it it's certainly true of me you know I'm it, it's like I'm socially awkward I'm a nerd right like I grew up <laughs> working with computers and spending my life you know hunkered down behind a drum set learning how to do all the stuff that I do so socially I've never been all that great I've gotten way better at it and to the point where people think like that's the entirety of me, but, but the reality is no, it's not. And like you, you know, Lisa and I don't go out a whole lot when I'm not playing. Yeah, we do sometimes, but otherwise it's just like, Oh yeah. You know, like ah, it's exhausting being around people. I, I, I firmly believe that I am actually an introvert. Um, it, it, and I just can put on a good front, but then when mm. I'm done, like I need to like hole up and recharge. So, um, so yes, this has happened to me many times. In fact, probably many more times than I even realize because people will want, like you said, want more out of the relationship. And, and I, I become aloof for lack of a better term. Uh, and I, I know it can come across that way. And then that pisses people off. We had a thing yeah. actually last week at CES 
there's a, you know, we've got actually with Mac Geek Gab, the, the, you know, Apple focused sort of it's car talk for Apple users and kids. You can ask your parents what that means if the reference doesn't land. But uh, <laughs> we answer people's questions. Right. And so but we've been doing it 14 years. And, and so we have a lot of listeners that have been, been with us a long time. We have a great, you know, show related relationships with them. And when we travel to places, sometimes people say, hey, I'd like to buy you a drink. I'd like to buy you lunch, whatever. And I totally get that. Right. And I'm thankful for that. Um, but I don't always have time for that. And especially at you know, a show like CES, when, you know, my time on the ground is is pr- basically booked a month out, you know, and and um, there's this one listener that over the years has reached out every time and been like, Hey, you know, it'd be great to get together. I know you're busy. Right. And he's always reached out to me in the past. And I've, I've always been very honest about it and said, Hey, you know, I, I appreciate that. If we have time, I would love to, but this trip, you know, it doesn't look like it. This time he reached out to my co-host and John basically replied and said the same thing, but he did say, I'll check with Dave and I'll get back to you. He never got back to the guy. Um, the answer would have been the same as if he had reached out to me, which would have been, yeah, we, we're not going to have time. But the guy got upset that he never got back to him. And then it went a lot further than that. Uh, you know, it was, I'm going to stop listening to your show. I think the guy actually like deleted his Twitter account. It like, it really went far. Um, but he was, you know, he was upset about this and I, and I, I get it, but other than this one thing of I'll, you know, I'll reply to you. And, and three days later, you know, John had not yet replied to him. Uh, there was no, there was no other, you know, explicit, yes, we will get together kind of thing. Um, and it upset this guy. And so we lost that listener last week, presumably. Um, I, I can't know whether he'll ever listen again, obviously, but, um, but yeah, it just went through it. And it's like, yeah, I, like, I, I just so have to, rem- I have to remain me. Um, and maybe just being a little more transparent about me, especially when those initial requests come in, right? Like, which I usually am. It's like, look, I, I, you know, in the right circumstance I've, and I've done this, I've, I've had, you know, lunch or drinks or whatever uh, with listeners. I actually prefer it usually when I can do it with several at once and have like a, a little, you know, podcast related meetup or whatever, or like you would with a band, you know, a gig in a bar where everybody's there at the same time. Like that's fine. But uh, you know, you said you're protective of your personal time. Uh, That's very much true of me as well. Uh, Not just because I'm, I'm, you know, somewhat of an introvert, but also just because I don't have a whole lot of it. (laughs) Um, So, you know, I think think you gotta be clear about it. Yeah. It's painful when um, the person interprets. So I bet I would go so far as to say I bet a lot of musicians are introverts to some degree. Yeah. There are certainly those people who can walk through a room, are true extroverts, bask in in that, um, and and operate at that level. And it's a kind of a beautiful thing to behold if that's truly who you are. Sure. But I would say I'm thinking kind of going through my inventory of people, friends of mine who are musicians. Certainly, the guys in my band. I uh, yeah, ten out of ten of them I'd say are 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 you know they play you know they give it all on stage that outward expression of uh, emotion you know that's a, that is a it's a real thing on stage but um, yeah introverts would be a, a good word but man it's just painful to think for a moment that someone's actually ascribing to you oh Mr Rockstar you know thinks he's bigger than he is yeah and, right you know, that's, that's and that's, that's really not what it be, is that's not not what it is no it's not so, and, and that's always kind of made me uh, like i'm hyper aware of that with with the people uh you know that i look to at the, you know of whom i am a fan right it's like yeah like you seem like a person i would love to hang out with but like i like i know that i cannot come to that conclusion correctly without us actually like hanging out with each other. And that needs to happen more organically than I was at your show kind of thing, you know? All right. So the magic question is, is, is there a way for introverts to navigate? Cause I can't see, a, Hey, I'd love to, but I'm an introvert. I really can't. That doesn't <laughs> work. That's not going yeah. to yeah. work. So, but you know, have you ever seen it executed? Well, um, no, I I don't think there's a, like once the, 
desire is there. Well, the way you ex- execute, once the desire is there and they are able to make contact, it's over, right? Like if, if it, it's one thing, if somebody comes up to you at a gig and you talk and it's like, Hey man, thanks. Yeah, this is great. And maybe you even have a conversation because you both love the Beatles or whatever, right? Like there's yeah. a true connection there in the moment. Nothing's fake. It's all genuine. But then you go home and that person's like, Hey, would you like to get dinner? And it's like, uh Oh, like, no, I don't think so. Right. I don't think so. No, like yeah. that's, that's where the question comes in. Like, how do you address that without turning this person sour? Uh, so try this. And I don't know. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So may- maybe what the approach is, is to understand if you are an introvert and you are any good at your craft and you're going to attract people to come. Maybe one of the things is, is you have to be prepared for this eventuality. And so it, yeah. it might shape a few things. It might shape the amount of friendliness that you exhibit on, on social media. So be careful about, you know, getting into, you know, personal conversations, uh, you know, with your, your fan base. It might, sh- you know, maybe, maybe part of the solution is drawing that boundary uh, and, and it's not a natural thing to do because it's, it's now a conscious act of something that you have to, you have to, deploy right but maybe one of the things is you have to be kind of careful about it um and and understand what's happening um and maybe you have to you know somewhat perfect giving off the vibe i was thinking about you know like i said the best piece of advice i ever got as a amateur musicians from you about thanking people who come to see you during the break yeah there's a way to do that, which is just purely a professional thank you It, it is it is a it is a professional courtesy not give off the vibe i'm so desperate for your and so appreciative you know uh, those types of things and there is a certain you know like like many professional skills it's a learned thing but maybe maybe the thing is if, if this if this scenario describes anybody listening to us today maybe one of the solutions is is you know embrace it that it's a likely problem and have a strategy and the strategy might be again you know draw boundaries in a thoughtful professional way Again, the goal is keep the fan, keep the customer, but avoid the uncomfortable situation, you know, where where you have to say no to something because a boundary has been crossed. So, you know, focus on drawing that boundary professional, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I got to say this is very uncomfortable for me to share, but um, it's gotten to the point where I since I play so much in my local town, um, people come and. uh, women will want to to hug me and say hi. How have you been? And that's that's clearly on the on the wrong side of that line, right? That is clearly, while flattering, it's clearly not the right thing. But that happens, you know, in our in our Mac industry as well. I was right? say you it know? happens everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it does. Sure. But that that's an example of a boundary that you probably want to want to draw. You like shake hands, right? Yeah. Um, and and again, if you focus, and this is kind of coming clearer to me as we talk it out, if you focus on the vibe of the extent of our exchanges, I'm going to play my ass off for you, and I'm going to give you this is what I have to give for you. The exchange is based upon me playing music, and if you like it, you know that type of thing. You know, it, it as a band develops an audience because having that audience will give it leverage to get more gigs. Um, I think you got to keep this in mind because again, you know, as quickly as you have an audience, you can lose an audience, but an audience that's in it for your music is probably going to be a little bit more loyal than its audience. That's in it for your social capital. Make sense. Uh, maybe I, yes. I, well, certainly for you and me, that's true, right? There might be some folks that maybe the music isn't, isn't all that good, but they throw a heck of a party and you want to be there for that party. I it, I don't mean you, but like uh, generally speaking, like there, I think th- I think it could go either way. Um, yeah. But but be aware of like th- if that's the scenario you want to be in, even if you're the person, let's say people are there just for the party, which let's be perfectly honest at a lot of our gigs, that's the people that are drawn right. They're there for the party. The music is part of that, but it's not the whole of that. Uh and if but even in that, people have a, have a, their place to play. Ex- you guys I was just going to say, party, right? even there, you're the host of the party. So, welcome. and maybe that's the right way to think of this, right? Is, y- yes, you might be on stage, you know, you're pouring your heart out, 
either with cover songs or original songs or, you know, whatever it is, but you're exposing, you know, an emotional part of yourself on stage that you might not ever expose to a group of people in any other way. Right. Yeah. And, but what you are, what they are seeing you as is the host of the party. So you have to sort of be aware that, Oh, the host of the party is this person that's very open. Well, no, the host of the party is different from the person that's on stage and you need to sort of communicate that. That, and I, I think that's maybe that's the way to look at this is 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 just that that, you know, think of realize that people are seeing you as the host of the party um, and and, you know, and, and then just play that role. You're the host. That's it. And you, when you're here, you're the host and, and elsewhere. Oh, it's not my party. You know, it's fine. But you can come to the next gig. And maybe that's it. When somebody says you want to have dinner or whatever, say, oh, you know, I, I'm i busy all the time, but I would love to see you mm, at my next all the gig. Time. I'm busy yeah. all the time, but I would but love to see you at my next gig. Yeah, I like that. Right. I mean, that's a that's a nice way of communicating exactly what you want to communicate and yeah. generally speaking true. I mean, it's, there's a little bit of hyperbole there. You're not truly busy all the time, but you know, I think people, but it, understand sends a what message. That means. I, yeah. I, it sends a message. I don't do that. I don't do that. Yeah. I yeah. don't do that. That's the message. It's not you. It's me, right? Yeah. I don't do that. So show up at the next gig and you know, th- there will be people that, that, that are the exception to this rule. You know, if somebody comes to 10 gigs or whatever, And you wind up making a connection with that person and you wind up becoming friends and all that. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that, but you just got to be careful. You got to be picky. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. See, I thought we were just two socially awkward guys wandering the desert together, but this actually makes a little sense to me. Well, we are. And we (laughs) we might have stumbled on a little bit of water. (laughs) Hey, while I was at CES last week, I I want to I want to introduce a segment. I mean, it's not anything different than we've done here, but you know, I, I mentioned our Mac Geek Gab podcast. We do a segment on that uh, called "Cool Stuff Found," where it's things that we found that are relative to that audience. Well, while at CES looking for exactly that, I found some things that are relative to our audience here. Do share, yeah. So the first thing that I'm super excited about. Um, actually, and before I even go into this, I will say this, uh, one of the best parts about cool stuff found on our Mac geek Gab podcast is that most of the stuff does not come from us, the hosts. Most of it comes from you, our listeners or them, our listeners to be more accurate. So feedback at giggabpodcast.com. If you find anything, a piece of gear that you're using, a cool new band, like, like no rules, just anything that you think is cool. Send it into us. We'd love to share it back with you, uh, all of you, the audience. So, and, and plus that way we learn about things too. So that said, the first one, Soundcraft is a Harman brand, right? Which is also a Samsung company now, but you know, Harman JBL, right? They've been making sound gear for a very, very, very long time. And, Their relatively new um, or current model, I should say, it's not brand new, uh, UI24R digital mixer is, it's a thousand bucks, um, 20 channels input, true, like, actually it's it's 24 channels input, but there are 20 XLR jacks on the front of this thing. Uh, It's a 4U rack mounted thing. It has no screen uh, of its own, but 20 inputs, I'll get, I'll get to the screen in a minute. Uh, 20 inputs, 10 of which are combo inputs. So you can plug an instrument or an XLR jack in the other 10 are just XLR. So you can put, you could plug 20 microphones into this thing. If you wanted the first two inputs actually can be routed through amp simulators. So if you just want to plug a guitar in, you can do that. Um, it's got eight aux outputs and two left, right, you know, main outputs. So you can have, all the monitor mixes you want. And in fact, and this is the beauty of these digital mixers, the current version of their software lets you use the headphone jacks as even more outputs. So you can actually have 10 aux outputs uh, on this thing. It's got its own Wi-Fi built in. So you don't need to add that literally that thousand bucks and you are good to go. I mean, you need speakers and microphones and all that, but you don't need anything else for your mixer. As long as you have either a laptop, a phone or a tablet, that you can connect to the Wi-Fi. You don't need an app. It's all web-based. The It's HTML5. The I, I spent probably an hour with the product manager on this thing as, as he talked me through it all. 
this thing's fan looks fantastic. I I'm going to get my hands on one and and test it and I'll let you know more about that. But um, but this really looks like for the price and the new software that they've put on this thing um, and they keep updating it. It just like I'm super excited about this thing. Okay, so this is a um, a a mixer that looks like it's inputs only, and then all UI is done through an app. Well, inputs and a, inputs and outputs. I mean, it, inputs it, and outputs. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. And, uh, correct, correct. So no faders, no EQ section. Everything is done through through uh, uh, an interface on a on some kind of mobile device, right? Correct. A lap. Well, you could you can plug an HDMI screen into this thing and also plug a, a, a mouse and a keyboard in and you can do it that way. So you, you, you mm. don't have to have a mobile device. You could do it all right on the mixer if you wanted. Um, and Soundcraft is known for quality um, um, preamps. Yeah. Yeah. People that have been using these things love it. And you know, it's um, it's all these what Studer preamps that they've got in this thing. And, uh, and then it's got USB input and output. So if you wanted to have, you know, something from a USB device, either your laptop or, you know, something else playing music into this that perhaps you were playing along with, with tracks or whatever, that's fine. You can assign those to channels, but you can also take music out of it. It can be, it can record directly on the mixer to two track, directly on the mixer to multi-track mm -hmm. or to your laptop so that you could plug it into, it comes with Ableton live, but, uh, you could plug it into anything. It's just an audio interface at that point. So, you know, Logic or Pro Tools or whatever you want. Now you've got multi-tracks of, of everything from your show. And it's got the full, like, you know, I'll, I'll compare this to our Personas or, yeah. or, you know, the Behringer stuff. It's got the full arrange, arrangement of effects, you know, and EQ and, and gates yes. and limiters and all that stuff. It does. It has um, four different effects channels that you can run. I think it might be more than four, but it's at least four. Um, it has an auto mixer in it, which doesn't really apply for like a live rock band setting. But if you're doing like a live talk show or if we were doing this podcast live and we had a couple of guests, those auto mixers make all the difference in the world. Uh, so it's got that. That was just added with software. It, it, this thing's really cool. Um, I'm, I'm very excited to, to, mm. to mess with it. I know it. Well, it. I mean, it's clear that this has been designed as the result of iteration, right? They And it's designed by people that are actually out there doing this, mixing and knowing what has to happen. You can now link these two things together. They've got, there's two Ethernet ports on them. You can link them together and either have extra tracks or you could have one that was used to mix just monitors and then send those same sends over to the other one that was being used to mix the house, you know, like... Super flexible. I'm really cool. impressed with this thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. So nine ninety nine seems a little expensive though. Oh, I don't think so. Not when you're comparing it to like the 20 the, channels. The, yeah. The, the Behringer or the Mackie. Um, the, I think, I think that's the, well, it's 20, 20 true inputs. I think, I mean, it's called the UI 24 R. So they call it a 24 channel mixer. You can plug in, uh, you can have two coming for the live show, you can have two coming from USB and two coming from um, uh, RCA jacks that you plug in like a, you know, a CD player. iPod, uh, yeah. yeah, an iPod would be more. Wow, that's my microphone buzzing around there. Um, see how excited I am? Yeah. <laughs> and it's got Wi-Fi built into it, right? So and so they have uh, they have this 20 slash 24 channel is the biggest size and they have a couple smaller sizes. Yeah, I, I don't think the smaller sizes have quite the feature set that the 24 R has. But but okay. yes, they do have smaller versions. So, yeah, cool. yeah I know. All right, looks interesting. What else? Um, the the uh, it and the, the at play jammy dot com. These folks were demoing the jammy portable guitar. I, this thing packs up. It'll fit in your backpack. Um, and it's a portable guitar. It's got a regular output on it. Uh, so you can plug it into an amp. They plugged it into an amp. It it was just plugged directly into the amp. There was no like, you know, model or in the way or anything. And they just kind of cranked up the distortion. And some guy was playing some Hendrix stuff and it sounded great. It was just some attendee came up and was like, hey, can I play? And they're like, sure, here you go. Mm. And it sounded good. I mean, is it the best guitar sound I've ever heard? No. But for something where you need to travel and throw it in your backpack and go, yeah. Um, and it's, uh, what is it? 399 on pre-order, but it's also, 
Um, and it breaks down. It kind of looks like you're field assembling like a, a rifle or something, the way this yeah. thing all comes together. Yeah. And, uh, and, and then it's got a, uh, MIDI output via USB. So you could plug directly into like your, your phone or your tablet so that, and you can use an app to get different sounds. So you could like practice in your hotel room and mm. all that good stuff just on headphones. So, and it runs for that. It runs on a battery. And I think they say you get like four hours, four hours on a battery. So, so it's got, it's got a attachment that kind of simulates a body for where you are rest your arm or an attachment that simulates a pick guard yep. for when you come down to give you some degree of feel. I always am kind of skeptical of these things because, you know, playing guitar is a muscle memory type of thing. Yes. And, and, uh, you know, the feel of your instrument and the, but you know, in, in, 17 inches long this thing is you know very 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 portable so it sounds right. interesting you know yeah in a pinch uh, or if you need to travel then yeah that, that's it yeah. yeah it's a four-piece thing you've got the the neck the part where you pluck the strings and then um yeah like you said and then a pick guard and a place to rest your arm and yeah i put it on i mean it, it felt i'm not a guitar player so i'm not really, like the fact that it felt n- natural enough to me may or may not mean anything but yeah it's pretty cool got it. yeah cool yeah. all right and uh, you know how I am about protecting my hearing, Paul. Mm. And I'm always interested when somebody's coming out with new earplugs. And there's this company called Loop at loopearplugs.com, L O O P earplugs.com. They, they, um, th- these things, when you put them in your ear, it's just a little filter that goes, you know, in, into your ear canal. And then the part that sits in your outer ear is a metal loop. Uh, it's very comfortable to wear. The, the filter is actually a very high quality filter. That's a 20 DB reduction, but it's very flat reduction. So it, it sounds very naturally. It's not like putting foam in your ear where you get like, you know, just Muffled. all, yeah, nothing essentially. Right. Uh, but this, this channel on the outside or the, the loop on the outside actually becomes a sound channel and it actually funnels sound down into the filter and it's all built to work together. Uh, I used them a little bit. The the uh, Foo Fighters actually played on Wednesday night at uh, at CES, and I have, probably have some stories to tell about that too. But uh, <laughs> as always, but um, but the uh, I I tested these things a little bit there, and then my wife brought these to uh, a fling gig on Saturday night, and she said they're the best earplugs she's ever worn. Uh, they sound great. Uh, you know, I was comparing mine to custom fits, which is a whole different world, but they, they sounded good to me too, but, but she has tried every type of universal fit earplug and, and truly like used them many, many times. And, and she said she has never been happier than she, than she was with these and they're 30 bucks. So, uh, we'll put a link in the show notes, but like whatever it. you can do to protect your hearing and, and they kind of look stylish. You know, sure. <laughs> looks, it's like like you're wearing, it looks like you're wearing an earring inside your ear. Inside your ear. Yeah. So it's, you know, whatever. Like you're at a rock show. That's fine. Like it looks cool. And you can get them in different colors. And I think there's like black and gold and red and silver. And so you can, you know, mix and match to match style. Your style. Yeah. There you yeah. go. Well, that's Rose good. Gold. Sounds like a productive CES for you. It was. It was. Um, that Foo Fighters show, you know, they played the uh, the JBL Harmon now Samsung party that uh, I've kind of mentioned a few times after going to CES last year, it was Cheryl Crow and Lenny Kravitz. And I came back nonplussed as some of you might remember this Foo Fighters show. The, the band was excellent. The sound was stellar. I mean, just perfect. Same venue that it's, that it's been in, in the past couple of years. It's a place called the joint at the hard rock, but um, Man, it just like such a good show. They really, you know, that, that band knows how to deliver a rock show um, and really it's, knows how it's to. It's what they are and who they are. Yeah, exactly. I mean, to, do, to play at that intensity every freaking night out and never take I mean, You never hear about a bad Foo Fighter show, do you? No. And I've seen them in weird scenarios. Like I was, I was realizing this. I don't think I've ever seen what I would call a normal Foo Fighters show. Um, I did, I did buy a ticket to see them once and would happily do so again. But the show that I went to was at Fenway park, which is a weird place for a band to play anyway. And it was on that tour after Dave Grohl had broken his leg. So he was, um, he was in his, you know, this crazy throne or whatever. So, and, and you having seen him in, in, you know, not in the throne, it, he, 
puts off a lot more energy. He was fine in the throne. The show was entertaining, but you know, it wasn't a normal show because he wasn't bouncing around, you know, singing and yeah. playing guitar. Um, and then I saw him back up that Sound City band thing uh, in Austin. I saw them do their own show in Austin, but it was weird. It was like a, a last minute thing and they played their entire album all the way through and then played a bunch of hits. But it wasn't in front of a crowd that had like bought tickets to see the Foo Fighters. So, but they know, they just know how to entertain. And that was the thing they did the other night is they were like, they even asked at one point, Grohl asked, he's like, all right, how many people here? Maybe there were maybe a thousand people in the club. It's like, how many people here have seen the Foo's before and, and how many haven't? And it was like 50, 50, you know, which, which makes sense at a trade show. You know, there's a bunch of people that are just going to go for the, because they didn't pay for the tickets. And, um, and they delivered, they knew how to entertain that crowd. They were, it was stellar. I mean, Dave, Dave was, um, well lubricated, um, which <laughs> I Vegas. It's, it's hot there. It's so hot you gotta, there. <laughs> yeah. You got to keep drinking. Um, and I've, I've seen him well lubricated before on stage. It's not every time. Uh, but, but sometimes that sound city show in Austin, he was pretty well lubricated. Rick Nielsen was giving him a hard time for being drunk. And Dave was like, kept looking at him like, no, shh, 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 no, no, no. Don't say anything. You know? <laughs> um, but, uh, he, he fell off the stage again, Paul, he went down to do some antics and coming back sort of around, he fell right off the front of the stage and it was like, man, like, don't break your leg. And thankfully he didn't, he got back up and he ran up to the mic and, and said, uh, that's happened before. Oh, like, geez. Yeah. Yeah. It has. Yeah. That's why we love Dave. That's why we love him. That's exactly it. Yeah. No, they put on a really good show. They played, um, they, the gig got kind of derailed. Um, the crowd was sort of crazy and, and that was fine. It felt more like a frat party than, than anything else, uh, toward the end. And Taylor at one point looked at Dave, Dave actually asked the crowd. He's like, all right, so, you know, do we stick with like the professional rock show thing or do we go into full on keg party mode? And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and that's when Taylor called over to Dave and, and audible stay with me, the faces cover. And Dave liked that idea. So they, they played, uh, they played stay with me and Taylor sang it and they brought people up on stage and it was just, it was fun. You know, That's everybody, cool. it was fun. They yeah. are fun. They are. Have you seen them before? I have not seen the Foo Fighters. It's definitely them and Pearl Jam were two bands that I would love to see. So, you know, I've been dissy about nineties music, mm -hmm. music that started in the nineties, but those, those are two that I would love to see. I mean, I've seen, I've seen the Pearl Jam documentary and I've seen, yeah. you know, I saw sound city and, you know, and I've seen the Foo Fighters on TV quite a bit, but I just want to get in there and just kind of soak up that energy. You do that. I, and I feel the same way about Pearl Jam. I've never seen them, but that I would love to, because it, because it's that sort of, I, at least the feeling that I get is it's, it's that sort of um, unpredictable energy, right? Like you just, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. And that's, that's it's how a rock that and roll show. it's a rock show. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's just not a rock scripted show. down to the last minute. Right. Right. Something could happen. <laughs> Something you know, could happen. Real guys are playing real instruments and yep. you know, yeah, no, it, it, that's definitely a bucket list thing for me. Yeah. Are, are they touring now or is that a, a one-off corporate thing? No, they hadn't played a gig in like two months, but they're doing, there's some benefit I saw they're doing maybe out your way for, oh, I can't remember for somebody who passed away. There's mm. a, there's a benefit happening. I'll, I'll look it up, but um, yeah, 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 yeah. They, um, yeah, yeah, they, you know, they know how to put on a so, show. So. To a lesser degree, I had a couple of interesting gigs, you know, to start the year. Um, I have been crazy busy and I kind of stacked too much stuff for the first part of the year. So House Rockers had um, basically last half of November and December off. And so we got together for rehearsal first week of the year just to brush some rust off, which was great. And it turned out there wasn't really any rust. But um, I had a special show, which was a Tom Petty tribute that actually included was half people from the house rockers and half people from acoustic madness. And then a couple other, you know, Joe Rizzi, my old drummer sure. from the house rockers and Tom Duell, uh, Mary Ellen's husband on bass. And so we did that last Saturday night and it was great, it, but it, it's, uh, it was intense in preparation, getting up to it just because, uh, hey, Paul, so hang on one people. second. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, weird audio thing on my end. You were saying my friend. Yeah. I was saying, so we had this petty gig and in the preparation for it, um, you know, they're all people that I love to play with. I handpicked them because they're, they're my friends. I play with them in the house rockers. Sure. I play with them in acoustic madness. And, um, it was great. 
the preparation took on occasional, we only had, well, actually the first rehearsal, we had two rehearsals scheduled for, to, to do 30 songs. And uh, we did the show last year. So a lot of it was just dusting off. I think we added about five new songs this year, but um, there were people in, I'm reminded that there are people who the, the task of covers is a very uh, precise thing. And I am not a precise person in that way. I'm listening for something different about the essence of the songs. I'm not, you know, especially for a two rehearsal, you know, prep. I'm not, I'm not terribly focused on guitar solos being note for note or sure. bass lines being absolutely note for note, but some people are. And then actually that's the way they hear. There's this, there's a certain amount of ADD that kicks in for some people that it, you know, serves them really well because they're great prepares. I'm much more like, all right, I got, I got a task. I got 30 songs in front of me that we got, got to get to. Um, this one's easy. I know everybody knows that I'm going to give it one run through. And you know, if, if someone messes up, I'm going to assume you're going to listen to it and know what you have to fix. Actually, that's the way it was for me for most of it. It's like, I looked at it as a, almost like a project management task. I got to get us to the finish line. If I get bogged down on one song and the specifics of one song, likely we're not going to get to all, all 30 songs that we got to rehearse. Right. Plus I know, but actually the, the, the big thing is I know these people and I know they can play and I know they have pride in what they do. They'll get it done. That's kind of what drives all of my decision-making these types of things is like I pick people because I know that they won't slouch on it. They care. Right. They're good enough musicians. They have good enough ears to work themselves out of any jams. That's part of the deal of how I get some of these one-off shows done. That's how it works. Right? Yeah, exactly. I think that's how it works. And a little bit of it is managing the personalities too. I mean, a little bit is let, you know, if someone needs to take 45 seconds, to, so <laughs> kind of circling around to our first conversation, you know, it's a, it's a um, interpersonal relationship management task, right? Like if right. someone needs to express something to problem solve in real time, amongst the rest of the group you help them get to that point and then you kind of casually say like all right cool can i count on you to have that on your own and they kind of look up and they say yeah, yeah i got it yeah. so um but anyway the gig came and went and it was great and i gotta say playing so in the house rockers where you know maybe 60 percent more kind of funk and and uh and soul and about 40 percent rock and roll and to play a whole rock and roll show is just so glorious for me. And, you know, I love Tom Petty. You know, he's he's one of my two. Right. Bruce and Tom are, are, are what is fills most of my musical head most of the time. Sure. And, uh, you know, to be able to play a whole night and the people just got into it. And I just promoted it as the Petty Party. Right. Right. Yeah, I PK, saw that. Yeah. P, PK and friends. And the word got out and people came. People danced to the most, you know, wildflowers. I mean, people danced to, to the chilliest things. They sang along to everything. It was people there who clearly wanted to have a night of Tom Petty music and, you know, kind of relive that stuff. And it was such a rewarding thing. The band played actually very, 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 very well. Couple, you know, a couple of tempo things, couple of uh, roadmap things, but to be expected with one full rehearsal, gonna right? Say, yeah, that's going to happen. Right. Yeah. yeah. Not too bad. And, uh, but we had a good time. So that one was good. Then I go immediately from that. And this Friday night, another special show we're doing me and acoustic madness. Uh, we're doing a, an acoustic tribute to Springsteen, Linda Ronstadt and John Fogarty. So each of us have done an individual show with bands. So some of this is just taking those formats. And, and for this, you know, acoustic madness is just a three, three member, you know, three part harmony group. Sure. We're adding Russ from the house rockers will play drums. And then Mary Ellen's husband, Tom is going to play bass. So we're adding a little bit of a rhythm section, but uh, we're kind of, not a lot of time again two or three rehearsals to kind of walk, walk through this stuff and make some decisions uh so it's been a lot of stuff then the house rockers are back in rehearsals and and we're really because this is our 20th year i'm really determined to turn our show over almost completely so we're we're going really hard at adding new material we've added some really cool stuff i'll just tell you a few so we're doing um crumbling down by uh john mellencamp Wow. Uh, yeah, great, great horn chart written for that by John Asana, my band. And it just pops in a really cool way. Very big sounding song. Uh, we uh, doing Dancing in the Street by Bowie and Jagger. Yep. yep. That version. Okay. What do you think Not of that? Um, I've got no. a little hate from Bowie fans saying, really, that's the one you're going to do? But, but uh, uh, you, can't, you, know. you can't think of it that way. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know. It, right. It's not, it's not a Bowie song in that sense. I mean, yeah. it, it, right. It's just, but it's just a good party tune. That's it's good party tune. That's the way to think of that. I Thank think. You. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I'm with you. Uh, but last I'm, night but I'm not a, like, I'm not a Bowie person. In fact, I, so I, I may be the wrong guy to ask is, is all I'm saying, but there you go. Got it. Yep. 
Last night we added New Sensation by NXS. Great tune. It is a great tune, but here's the deal. Gotta you know, because sing the like, hell out of that thing, though. Yeah, Simon's singing that, and he's 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 you know was well prepared last night, and I think he's going to be great on it. He was great on it last night. It is an interesting tune because it is that droning guitar riff, that that rhythmic you know thing, all the way through it, pretty much. Right there, the breaks for the choruses, but um, it has to drive and not get lazy about the drive because um, it is very droning, right? Yeah, you got to, you got to, like I said, that song's all about the vocalist. And and I really like In Excess. Oh, well, that dude, holy crap. I mean, they wrote great songs. They wrote great songs. They, they understood the value of space, right? They didn't try to fill every every moment with with noise right they were really they understood that and uh but they had one of the best vocalists uh, uh yeah. in rock front and roll man. history and yep. and a great front man but he was a, like just listen to the records that dude could sing i mean oh <laughs> god yeah Hutchins, yeah 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 so we added that we added in an old 70s song what you won't do for love so there's an interesting one this doesn't so the way that we do it is the singers you know choose what they want to sing and they bring it in and you know we, mm. we now will try just about anything and the audience will tell us if, it, if it's if it if it stays yeah so this is a departure because that's a, you know fairly kind of jazz you know light jazz you know, groove to it. Um, very different. It'd be interesting how to place it in the set lists, you know, amongst all this other high energy stuff. But, um, you know, that one next to um, uh, Dead Man's Party would be an interesting juxtaposition, right? Uh, yeah. I, so is Dead Man's Party part of your set now? I know it's kind of come and gone it. over the years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, no, it's in. You know, we, we have, everybody's getting in. It's still not quite what it can be. It's still... My, it might be a mixed thing. You know, everybody's playing the right notes. It's right? a hard and, tune. You know, it yeah. is a hard tune. It, and it's that, um, that songs that are single, you know, guitars are playing single note runs as the main part of the rhythm as opposed to power chords. Those are harder to pull off live. Oh, yeah. They just don't take the space, right? They don't, you know, it, it, you have to have the tone exactly right. They have to be in exactly the right place in the mix too. Yes. So again, yes. you can, you yes. can hide a lot of stuff in power chords, but when, a, when it's a song that the guitar is playing, you know, single notes as the, as the main part of the rhythm, that's a, bit, a little bit different and it's harder to pull off, but the horns are really big on that. And, and, uh, and Nick has kind of added a nice uh, kind of a clavy type um uh, part that wasn't there before that kind of takes a little bit of space. Russ keeps great time and, and uh, really drives that thing. Great. And, you know, Steve is playing that kind of meandering, well, rolling baseline really well. So it's good. You know, it, it, we moved the key, so it's in my range and um, uh, I, I like it. And you, that's one of those songs when you play the horns, play that, da, 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 yeah. you, the horn, the crowd goes, woo, you know, so right, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Of course. That's Sony house song. rockers doing more stuff. You know, two two special shows all within the first you know couple of weeks of the year, uh, and so it's just been really busy, a little bit stressful. And then after I get over this weekend, it'll ease up a little bit, um, and then we'll just kind of be in a more of a, a sane flow of, of more shows than rehearsals. And uh, we'll, I, we'll get there's our something really to be off. said for that. I was just thinking, you know, I've got well, we had a fling gig this last weekend, which actually went really well. Band played well. We played, you know, we talked a lot here you and me on the show about selecting songs for a party and that sort of thing. And I think we did a pretty good job of, of, you know, delivering. And, uh, and I think everybody in the band was happy too. I, it's hard to know, but you know, I think everybody was all right with the, uh, with the song list or the set list. But, um, and then I've got a gig on Saturday with monkey fist, which will be a blast because I can just walk into that one and we just play together. Um, and that's great. And then next week, I mentioned earlier in the show that Hedwig, the uh, or Hedwig and the Angry Inch for the full title, was um, was so popular that they're bringing it back next weekend at this uh, at this theater at the Seacoast Rep. And the first time in, that was the show that I was I was trying to bail out on, right? That, like yeah. that was yeah. Uh, but obviously, I had a blast doing it, and I knew I would have a blast doing it. It was just a time thing. So the first time we did it, you know that. I mean, I rehearsed it once with them. Then we went and did five shows. Now, by the end, by like, you know, New Year's Eve or whatever, 
it was fine. Like I understood the flow of the show. I was able to, to really get into it um, and, and play, but still I had not had any time to let it sink in. Right. I had learned it to the point where I could effectively deliver it, but I hadn't let it sink in. And you never can when you're just like rehearse, then do the show right away. And so I'm really kind of looking forward as you were saying this, I realized, Oh, you know, I'll be able to go and play Hedwig. Like it's this thing I already know how to do, <laughs> right. I get to go put on that comfortable pair of slippers and, and, and enjoy them as opposed to how are they laced? Are they just right? You know, like it's, it's comfortable now and I can just go and set up my drums and, and like enjoy playing it and looking forward to those tricky moments as opposed to, Oh crap, let's just make it through those tricky moments. You know what I mean? And the band trusts each other. We are losing our keyboard player who was our music director. She's, uh, she's actually got a gig doing um, uh, into the woods just off Broadway. Uh, so we have a different keyboard player, which means the conductor role will fall to yours truly. But that really, have you ever done that before? Well, sort of. I mean, I conduct Madhouse all the time. Right. And and, and this isn't all that different uh, with and when, when Billy and I when I did uh, Breck Tones with Billy Butler, we sort of co-conducted that show together. And honestly, with with even with Hedwig. Uh, Susie was most certainly the music director. She pulled everything together. She taught the harmonies to everyone and all of that. But as the show progressed, more and more of the conductor duties fell to me because it's a show about a rock band. So when it's time to count a song in, it, you know, like the drummer is the natural one yeah. to count everybody in. So that started happening. In fact, on uh, at the New Year's show, Susie came up to me and she's like, I don't know why we're doing this. It was right before the second act. And the way the second act starts is uh, Alyssa or one of the singers or the other singer other than Hedwig uh, comes out on stage and she sings a song and she basically looks at the band and, and I count the song in. And so Susie said to me, she's like, uh, look, I don't know what's going on, but the stage manager just came to me. Like there's like six people total, including the band involved in this show. Right. But she's like, it, it suddenly got all very formal. You know, she, she was sort of laughing. She's like, stage manager came to me and said, she wants Alyssa to look at me. And, and then I'll tell you when to count the song in <laughs> like, Oh, okay. She's like, right. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, yeah. All right. Fine. Like it, there was no point in arguing, but we all sort of acknowledged the, we didn't, I, to be fair, it, I don't, I have no idea what the, what the impetus was for this. Right. But it was like, okay, whatever. Like, so Alyssa came out on stage. She looked at me. Oh, and then she looked at Susie and then Susie looked at me and I counted the song. <laughs> it's like, all right, cool. That was, that was good. I'm glad we did it that way. So much cleaner. Yep. So we all laughed about it, but that was fun. You know? So yes, I have in a sense done this, um, but I'm certainly not the musical director. I'm just the guy making sure the show stays on the, uh, on the rails, but I will have to pay more attention to the script than I did previously because there, there, I don't, I don't know where some of these songs are supposed to start, you know? And, uh, and so I'll need to, I'll need to pay attention to that. So, yeah. But at least once the songs have started, I'll know them. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So got anything else, man? Or are we, uh, are we, are we around? We kind of got ahead of ourselves. We had a couple of, uh, of listener questions we're going to get to today. We must do them. Well, actually next week we got Dan Meblin from, from pop fiction. Uh, is going to be on. And then uh, how about week after that, we do all the listener stuff that we that backed up. Sounds on. like a plan. Sounds like all a right. plan, man. Yep. All right. Thank you for bearing with us folks. While we were uh, on our, what evidently turned out to be our little two week hiatus here, but or two and a half week hiatus, but, uh, but we're back and we'll be here on, on Monday. And then again, the next Monday and, you know, on so on and so forth until, uh, until we have another little hiccup in our schedules, but we're here. We mean it. We're here. Truly. We're staying. We're staying. We've been, even, we've been here. Even when we were away, we still followed the mantra, which is always, 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 always.